Hi everyone, I'm Talia. Welcome back to Tales of Triumph, the Love Medals podcast, where we share stories of victories in life and courage in the face of adversity. Thank you for celebrating perseverance, purpose, and love with us today. We invite you to join our community by subscribing now and finding inspiration from victories big and small. Your engagement and support mean a great deal to us, enabling us to grow and inspire even more people. It's a great honor to share with you my conversation with Damien Pelou and Tabitha Easton. Damien is a father of two, a lover of life, and all its adventures. Originally from South Africa, now a proud Canadian and proud to call Victoria home, Damien has been working as a police officer for 10 years and has served on the Greater Victoria Emergency Response Team's tactical unit. Damien responded to a hostage-taking and armed bank robbery along with his team and fellow officers in June of 2022. Tabitha is West Coast raised and loves spending her time outdoors. She is a mom to two kids and cherishes her time with friends and family. Damien and Tabitha went through something extraordinary together. That's not something the majority, if any of us, will ever experience. However, There are elements to their story of incredible courage, perseverance, determination, trust, and faith that anyone going through anything intensely physical and or mentally challenging can draw from, especially if you or someone you love is dealing with illness or injury and wanting to connect with the hope and faith within. This episode contains content of a sensitive nature that may be triggering for some individuals. Hi, Damien and Tabitha. It is such a joy and an honor to have you both as guests today. Damien, your story is one of such incredible courage and resilience. So I'm really excited to learn more about you and your story. And I'm equally as excited to have you, Tabitha, be a part of the conversation because I can only imagine that when something like this happens to a person, the people closest to them must go through quite the journey themselves. So I'm really excited to hear about your story and your experience as well. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So Damien, I know that you are limited in what you're able to share, but if you can share as much as possible about what happened that day when you and your team responded to the 911 call. Yeah, for sure. We were actually out early that day trying to look for a drug dealer. And uh, we were heading back to the office after hours of being in a van. There were seven of us in this van and six of us were in the back. Our team leader, John's driving and we're just winding down mentally when we got told uh, to switch our radio over to Saanich's Air, which is a municipality here in Victoria, because there's a bank robbery in progress. And so we all start hearing updates from patrol, like two males wearing balaclavas and with long guns. And so right away, your spidey senses go off and you just realize that this is this is a different kind of bank robbery than the traditional bank robbery where somebody would go into a bank, their hands in a jacket pocket, and they slip a note saying, I've got a weapon of some sort, hand over the cash, they get the cash and they're long gone. But as we're speeding over, we're just realizing that these guys are not leaving the bank. They're not leaving the area to, to make a getaway. They're just sticking around and you realize, man, there's something real to this you know Mm. so we get to the area we drive past and get a good look at the ground the parking lot patrol has contained the bank to the south and the north and there's different teams forming up and we let them know hey ERT is in the area we're here to assist let us know when they come out the bank and then we'll drive in to make sure that if these guys leave they're not gonna have a chance to get back in the bank because at that point they had taken multiple hostages in the bank that fired a round off in the bank. And so we could not let these guys get back inside by any means. Mm -hmm. So we were probably on scene for not even a minute or two when we got an update from patrol that said, yep, they're coming out the bank and confirmed long guns, wearing body armor and uh, balaclavas. And so my team leader drives into the parking lot, stops. We go through our tactics, challenging these guys and Within seconds or split seconds, actually, we're in a gunfight shooting at each other. That kind of sets the scene for a lot of 
what we're going to talk about here, but yeah. I took two rounds, uh, one to my left femur, which shattered, forcing some of the bone to splinter through my tack pants and be exposed. It blew through the femoral artery and veins, which dropped me right where I stood and I fell back into the van. I took another round through my torso. The round went through my ribs, through my stomach, through my liver, out the other ribs. And I didn't even know I'd been shot twice. I just knew we're in a gunfight. I got hit and now I'm down. Yeah. And out of the seven of us in the van, six of us got shot. The only guy that didn't get shot, Mike, was one of our more advanced trained medics on the team, which is a miracle. He was able to take action himself and then switch over to just manage the medical in that scene and throw a tourniquet on my left leg. Wow. Patrol were absolutely amazing. They came running in to support gunfire as well as to get involved medically and put tourniquets on people, pack wounds, hold chest seals, and just make themselves available to, to help and essentially help save my life. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if I had not had that help, I would have bled out and wouldn't be here talking about this today. Mm -hmm. So for you, when you realized you had been shot, what was the most significant thought or action that helped you stay focused on getting through it? Uh, I would say at heart, I'm a fighter. And no matter what I'm going to go through in life, I'm, I'm going to be okay and get through it. So when I got shot, I knew I was in a gunfight and I knew I had to get back into the gunfight, but couldn't because of my injuries. And once the bullets had stopped ripping through the van and I knew that they were no longer a threat, I had this immense peace about it all because I knew patrol was there and my teammates were there and... I didn't even know how my other teammates had been hit, but I just knew that I was safe. I didn't know how bad it was at that time, which was probably a good thing because <laughs> that may have changed my mindset. But mentally, I just knew that I'd get through this and I'd be okay on the other side, no matter what. And I've kind of had that through some of the tough things in my life mm -hmm. and just carry that through this one too. Mm, that's incredible. Tabitha, at what point did you realized Damien had been hurt and what was going on for you in that moment? He hadn't even got to the hospital yet when I had found out that he was injured. I knew very limited details. I'm a police dispatcher. So thankfully, I was not at work that day. I was actually getting my hair done and initially found out through my hairdresser, her Apple watch was going off. I guess there was reports of gunshots. And mm -hmm. so very shortly after my phone started blowing up, mm -hmm. um, there was some emergency call outs at work. And so one of my really good friends took that call out. She called me and said that she will get as much information as she can. She got there and was able to just confirm Damien was hit. But there was just so much going on, of course, and information wasn't accurate. Mm -hmm. It was just he was really bad and being airlifted. And then one of Damien's really close friends, I got a hold of him. They gave me a phone number for someone who was sort of in charge, like a liaison through Saanich. Mm -hmm. And so I got a hold of that liaison and I just told him, I'm like, Damien's partner, what is happening? Is he going to Vancouver? I heard that he's being airlifted. And she said, no, he's just arriving at VGH now. You need to get here right away. And I as soon as she said that, of course, I was worried in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But like you said, he's a fighter. I'm like, oh, like, mm -hmm. he's in good hands. I know that he was with his team and that they have medics and all of that. But the calm panic in her voice when she said, you need to get here ASAP, my entire body just started shaking. Yeah. And I just, I tried to get up out of the chair. Like, a, I had bleach in my hair. <laughs> And I just got up and I started walking out and my hairdresser was like, no, like we have to rinse your hair at least. It was just it. How is it possible like, to find a moment of comedy in this? My God. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we have to rinse out the bleach. And so I just sat down in the hair rinsing chair or whatever yeah. and I couldn't keep my body still. My lips, my arms, my legs, like entire body was just like shaking. Um, I said I wasn't going to cry. Yeah, I mean, that must have just been, like I said, I can't even begin to imagine. There's things that people go through in life and you can mm -hmm. try and have an understanding of it and you can have your compassion for it, but you really have no idea what that's like for someone. 
My hairdresser took control and said, give me your key. So all I remember is just being a passenger in my truck. She's taking me to VGH. And then I just got to the hospital. And then I saw um, our friend Rosie, who is just another angel on earth. Mm -hmm. And he just like embraced me. And it was so nice to have a familiar face in the chaos that was happening in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. So Damien, were you put in that medically induced coma at that point already? Or did you both have a chance to connect before that? No, I just before being loaded into the ambulance at the scene, did cut my pants, taking my boot off, put a tourniquet on, cut my vest and shirt off, applied two chest seals, and Mike injected some TXA, which is an anticoagulant, into me. And then that happened so fast. The time I was shot to the time I arrived at the hospital is about 15 minutes. Wow. Extremely fast. The level of care in this city is, is unbelievable. And then I don't remember the ambulance ride to the hospital, but once we got to Victoria General, I remember getting unloaded from the ambulance and escorted into the ER. And then that was it. I just have no memory. So yeah, somewhere in there, I was medically induced into a coma for seven days and woke up from that coma, knew where I was, knew why I was there, mm -hmm. what I'd done, what I'd seen, what I'd heard, had a vivid memory of, of everything leading up to me being there. And would almost describe it as just you fall asleep and have a nap and then you wake up and you're carrying on with life. But I had no idea that I was in a coma or that I'd been in a coma for that length of time. Oh, got it. Because that was going to be my next question, which w was if you had any memories of anything while you were in a coma, like any. I didn't. But what I find interesting is earlier that year, I had read a book on near-death experiences where people have these out-of-body experiences or they're at the scene and they're lifted out of their bodies and they can see themselves yeah. at the wreck or on the operating table or they have some sort of divine encounter or something and I woke up and I'm like ah, I didn't Bummer. get any of that <laughs> totally yeah oh wow well. yeah. yeah that's okay definitely not next time no no Tabitha what was that like for you waiting and wondering if and when he's gonna wake up I honestly never thought that he was gonna die there, that was it never even crossed my mind amazing I just n didn't know like the severity or like what had happened and then as soon as his mom got there that was really comforting as well and then they moved us up to another family room and that's where we just waited and waited and waited the only time where I guess death crossed my mind was when the surgeon came in and said yeah like this was bad mm -hmm. very bad mm -hmm. um and he said that he coded a couple times on the table. Yeah, I just knew. And I had like this piece that he was going to live. Mm -hmm. I just It was the unknown of yeah. the injury that was really hard. And so you mentioned he was going through operations. Damien, what operations did you undergo? I have a stack of papers about this <laughs> thick that talk about all the operations, scans, images, oh blood God. work. <laughs> um, but the, to sum it up, they ended up working on my leg first mm -hmm. to control the bleeding, talking to the surgeon, Dr. Dennis Kim, who's amazing. Yeah, he said they went in and basically cut from my knee up to my groin on the inside of my leg, cut that open to get to the artery, oh which it's a huge artery. So they found it easily, okay. pinched it off. It was the bleeding and the damage to the femoral veins that was just a nightmare for him to try and control. So they got the bleeding under control. They cut into my other thigh to grab some healthy artery and graft it over. Put a bunch of pins in there to stabilize all that. They put a rod through my hip down into the femur to stabilize that bone. And that whole medical team I had was unbelievable because the guy who puts in that rod stabilization system, they'll do that with imaging. This guy with his experience and skill set just went in with no imaging and nailed it first time. Wow. I was just so blessed to have top-notch doctors and mm -hmm. medical team working on me. And so they ended up cutting down either side of my calf to prevent compartment syndrome because my body just swelled up so much that it started cutting off blood supply to the lower leg. So wow. to save that limb, they had to reduce the pressure and relieve it. From there, they ended up cutting the midline incision up my abdomen, basically just gutted me. And I asked the surgeon after the fact, I'm like, what did it look like? That would have been cool to see. Like, do you have video or photos of this? But <laughs> And did they? 
<laughs> no, they didn't. Uh, but he was a surgeon down in the States for about 10 years and they take pictures and videos all the time for, for learning and teaching. But he jokes because they have a saying like the ABCs and first aid, you got airway, breathing, circulation, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas down there to be airway, breathing, camera. So, <laughs> yep, this person's alive. They're breathing. Good. Okay, camera. But the way he described it, he said that we cut you open and your torso was just full of stomach content, blood and feces. Oh my God. And so God. they start unpacking everything and figuring out, okay, they're going through intestine. Is this intact? Are there any holes or any damage? And there wasn't just, I broke some ribs when the bullet went in and then my stomach was just ripped open and the liver, the two organs that really can be salvaged and recover and the liver, as we know, regenerates and grows. So I was just, it's just a miracle that those two were the only ones damaged. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So Damien, how did the support of your friends and family play a role in your determination to overcome your injuries? Oh, it was everything. I have an incredible loving family, amazing friends. Tabitha is an amazing woman. Department were amazing. They sent two guys to sort of be the family liaison. One Tabitha mentioned, Rosie. His name's Rosales, but everyone calls him Rosie. I love that, Rosie. Um, the cool thing about him is we were friends before we were cops, and he knew my family. They knew him. And then a good friend of mine who's also a police officer, Sean, he was a great fit too. So to have everyone around me was just one of those things that just put me at peace and at ease. And I knew I had everything I needed to get through that. Yeah. The craziness about something like this happening is that it just, it must highlight the importance of connection and the people that you have in your life. Yeah. The department did a good job managing that. So Tabitha, how did you maintain your emotional strength and your support network while you were being there for Damien and his family? I don't really know if I maintained emotional strength, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I felt like an absolute wreck the entire time. I think like my nervous system was absolutely on overdrive for months. Mm -hmm. I would honestly say from the time I found out until he was home, I think. I think a lot of support and faith that his family showed me is really what kept me going. I was at the hospital all the time, and as was his family, and just the conversations that we would have, like their support was phenomenal. And without them there, I don't know if I would have been able to be as supportive as I was for him. Mm. It's just like in any relationship, like someone's having a hard day, the other person will step up and teamwork. It was teamwork. And if I was having an emotional time, his sister or his mom would be the one holding me mm -hmm. and vice versa, like when they were having hard times. Tabitha really downplays it, but she was incredible. She didn't work so that she could basically live out of the hospital. She slept out of a hospital chair for a couple months and while still running her life in the background. Yeah, when you say it was a, a real team effort, it was because she was such a source of comfort and peace and really my rock through that time where I was on so much drugs and in pain. And, you know, when Tabitha said she was an emotional wreck, she wasn't because she was remembering everything they were saying. She'd ask them all the right questions. When I didn't know what to ask, mm -hmm. she would remember everything. She's taking notes. She's updating my family. There's no ways I could have done that on my own. And so no. she really held it together in, in an impressive way and, and sacrificed a lot and, and did it so well. That's such a beautiful acknowledgement. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Damien, what was the most challenging obstacle to overcome during your eight weeks in the trauma unit? Oh, so many. But I think being in the hospital for that length of time, for 71 days, all through summer too, oh. you know, having sunshine here in Canada. <laughs> Rare is, days. Is, it is. It's special. So <laughs> the shooting was June 28th. I got released September 7th. I was just so active, so fortunate just to physically be in a position where I could do anything I wanted go running, hiking, hunting, swimming. And yeah, summertime, just love being in the water. And mm. so being confined to an eight by 10 room for the first few weeks, I was on my back, couldn't move, hitting buttons on a remote to lift my bed up. Mentally, knowing I was so broken, mm. I worked hard at at maintaining a healthy and fit lifestyle. And I, was, I was very fit before and, and being that broken and sore and in pain, 
was so hard. I ended up losing 60 pounds total wow. through this whole thing. And I couldn't shower for weeks, but the first time I got into the shower, I was standing there and I saw myself in the mirror and just started crying. I didn't even, oh. didn't even recognize the person I was staring at in the mirror. It was just, mm-hmm. that was very hard. Yeah. Throughout the week, there was some progression. I was able to sit up and then from there, I was able to get my legs over the bed and from there to stand. I basically had to work from the ground up. They cut my abdomen. I had zero core strength. There was so much muscle atrophy and weakness that I had to learn how to stand. I wow. It was a workout for me to sit at the edge of the bed and just sit there. I'd yeah. get so nauseous. I'd start sweating. I'd feel sick. I'd be in pain. And then I had to learn how to stand and I could stand for maybe 10 seconds and then have to sit down and I was out of breath and I'm like, man, I've never been this unfit in my life. What is happening? This sucks. I got shot. That's what happened. Yeah. I can only imagine not just physically what you had to face, but mentally and emotionally. I mean, that stuff is probably even more challenging, I would imagine. Tabitha, can you share a moment that stands out for you as a victory and a turning point during that time? Honestly, I think every little thing was a milestone Mm -hmm. that I was just so incredibly proud of him. The day that he first stood for 10 seconds and then when he stood for a minute to the first time he went outside to the first time he was able to shower or shave his own head or take a poop. (laughs) We high fived and celebrated those. (laughs) Those drugs were not kind to the system. Yeah, the things you take for granted, that must have been actually like no joke, probably really hard for you. Even like the first time he could handle and focus on his phone and FaceTime his kids, like there isn't one thing that stands out. It was every single thing that has led him to where he is today to be able to like walk on his own. And go pooping. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Damien, you mentioned wanting to be able to walk out of the hospital. Can mm. yeah, can you tell us how that felt and the significance that held for you? Yeah, I started getting notice from my doctor that oh, you should start thinking about working toward a release in two weeks from now. And at this time, I had five drains in me and different points in my abdomen, just draining out bile and blood and liquid. So there was a lot of complications still at play. I knew I needed to be at the hospital. I talked to different people about my release and I realized, man, I came into this hospital so broken and beaten. I'd love to leave on my own two feet. It was a statement of strength to myself to say that I've got this and I'm going to fight through it and get to a, a new normal. But also a statement to these two guys that caused the injury. You had so much intentions for harm and death and destruction, but there's life walking out of here, you know? And over the weeks and weeks that I was in there, I had family, friends, coworkers, colleagues come visit me. And I'm like, man, everyone who took the time to come visit me and encourage me, I think should get an invite to come celebrate this day with me. Looking back, I wish I just put an open invite to whoever wanted to be there because this affected so many people all over the city. But anyway, there was, I don't know, maybe 80 people Amazing. that were lining up outside the hospital, uh, my teammates, my family, friends, colleagues, paramedics, fire. Yeah, it was such a special, special moment. So I got wheelchaired out of the trauma ward down to the doors, stepped into a walker and maybe walked like six to eight steps with the walker and then got back in the wheelchair. That was such a huge moment for me and yeah. I'll never forget it. That is incredible. I had shivers the whole time you were describing that. No, absolutely. I love that it wasn't just something for yourself, but it was symbolic for the people that went through all that with you as a statement to people with intentions that are not love, you know, the opposite Mm -hmm. of that, in fact, and also for the city. That's so beautiful. I love that. Are there any other heartwarming experiences you had together and with your children during that time that you'd like to share? Yeah, there were so many. My kids were amazing through it. They just somehow had this patience and understanding that dad was hurting and that everything was going to be okay. 
my daughter Ellis, her birthday was September 2nd. And mid-August, if I remember correctly, I started to get these bits of hope for release. I'm like, okay, I'll be out for Ella's birthday. This is going to be perfect. It was hard to see them in the hospital because it's not a fun place for kids. And to see their dad beat up like that, that's not fun either. Anyway, I got hopeful that I'd get released September 2nd or before that. Um, it didn't end up happening. And a couple days before that, the kids came to visit. And I, I had to tell Ella, I'm going to be in the hospital. And she puts her hand on my arm. She's like, you know what, Dad? I'm okay with that. And we'll just make it fun in here. And I just started bawling. Oh I'm like, gosh. who is this eight-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so precious. And yeah, yeah uh, Tabitha, my family, they got balloons and signs and cupcakes and presents. And we just, we did it up in the hospital and made made the most of it, you know? Beautiful. Damien, you, you also describe your recovery as truly being a win for everyone involved in nursing you back to health. Can you share more about what you meant by that? Yeah, I think the guys on the team, ERT, got a lot of attention because we suffered the physical injuries and that was just more evident and obvious to everyone. But when I talk about a win for the team in the broader context of the first responding community, it was everyone from people at the dispatch center to all the police, the different teams coming in. There were people from different sections within the department, people from traffic, from the drug section, from patrol. And mm -hmm. we had cops coming in from Victoria, West Shore, Sydney, mm -hmm. Central Saanich. It was just unbelievable. And outside of the policing community, we had fire ready to jump in and, and help as needed. Ambulance came racing in. The two paramedics that were involved in my transportation, I specifically asked that they come to my release and they showed up and that was a special moment too. And going into the hospital, the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the nurses, the oh. care aides. Like um, hundreds of people. There was yeah. just yeah. so much love and support. And even outside of those circles, the community, the letters that came in, um, the gifts, the, the food that was brought, the gift cards, the drawings from kids. Did you and save any of those? Posties. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've got a whole, okay. I've got a whole booklet. So moving to read. The, yeah, just the support that the community mm -hmm. showed because coming through times of different movements, defund the police, um, having people come up to you when you're you're working special duties downtown and swear at you, and that's the minority of people. But during this event people really went out of their way to shine their love and yeah. Yeah. let it be known. And it, it was felt not only by me, but everyone involved. It was, it was actually overwhelming. That's bringing yeah. me to tears. <laughs> That's the stuff that I live for. There was one lady that took the time and I hope she listens to this or it gets back to her somehow. She had taken the time to write out a special note of appreciation or love and then on that same card, she'd put a quote of encouragement and then there'd be a gift. So I'd open up the letter and it would say like week one. So I was in the hospital for 10 weeks, let's say. And she had done only seven weeks. So that's my only thing. Like <laughs> could have been 10 weeks, but no, I'm kidding. But complaint. she did seven weeks of this. So week one, I'd open this letter, read what she wrote and just be so moved by it and then open up a gift that, and then I'd look forward to week two and then I'd get that. So Thank you. Yeah. If, if you're listening, please message yeah. Love Medals and we'll get you connected. That would be amazing. Totally. Incredible. I'm so happy to hear that. There's definitely been talk about teamwork and everything that you went through with your team. Damien, can you tell us about the bond and the camaraderie that formed between you and your fellow officers who responded that day? Yeah, for sure. We're a smaller team. We're pretty tight knit to begin with. Yeah, like any traumatic event, this is going to draw people closer together. And and it definitely drew us closer. I didn't know the other guys had been shot until I was out of my coma. I was up in the trauma ward. And then I had two teammates come to visit. And it was just so good to be connected to them again and have them there. But yeah, we stayed connected as a team. We do dinners. We go to different events together. Mental health has been such a priority for for policing in the last few years just mm -hmm. education about it and looking at like type a people especially guys on attack team that go through something tough it's just like oh, i'm 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 tough i can sweep this under the rug right. and ignore whatever yeah. but 
I feel like as a team, we really did a good job at prioritizing talking about it and sharing so many sidebar conversations with guys individually or in small groups. But as a team, we'd get together with a psychologist and talk through what guys were experiencing, where they were at. And amazing. Just the vulnerability in these guys and the maturity was just so encouraging because everyone has just been so real with it instead of hiding behind this warrior bravado. Yeah. Um, And I think it's just set a standard moving forward. And it's like that generally as a culture within policing now, which is so much healthier than ignoring it and drinking it away or, or whatever, you know? Yeah. So we'll, we'll always be knit together by this in a special way. Yeah. And so then Tabitha, did that kind of bond extend towards all the partners of the police officers? Have you become your own little family as well? Yeah, actually, we we have. We've been very intentional on keeping in touch. So the girls, the other wives, we meet up about once a month and go for dinner. So we, we do. We stay in touch. And it is. It's nice to catch up um, and not even just talk about the event Mm. but just know that we made it through yeah beautiful Mm. so Damien were there any acts of courage or resilience displayed by your fellow officers that day that really stand out for you that you'd like to acknowledge oh so many you know when we got in there with the van we had split seconds to make decisions and take action and that's where the power of training just kicks in and your body and mind just know what to do. And we did what we did. But to think of those patrol members that were in containment, that would have been essentially moving toward the gunfire or toward these two guys, they ended up hearing these gunshots, but still ran toward it. And the courage that these guys displayed was just unbelievable Mm -hmm. for them to jump in take action, and then also just be there to support us and work together as a team was just so special to reflect on and and just amazing. Yeah, I remember I was like, I don't want to watch anything. I don't know. I have this thing of when there's that accident on the side of the road, I'll purposefully look the other way and just keep driving because I don't know, it's just it's just a thing. So I was like, I was refusing to watch any footage of this. But I had friends say you have to see the incredible courage of these police officers running towards what was going on. And, and even as I think about it, it was absolutely incredible so how has this experience influenced your perspective on the power of teamwork and the victories that can be achieved together in the face of adversity there's so much teamwork throughout this entire story on so many different levels that must have influenced how you feel about human beings working together yeah for sure no individual could have done this on their own no one person could have gone in there and and stopped these two no one person could have worked at saving the guy's lives my life medically and then from there it's just the the broader community like we spoke to earlier the first responding community coming together the hard work it took for us to be here today and then through the mental side of it all has just emphasized the fact that we were designed to do life in community to have people in our lives you know it's the times where we're isolated and withdrawn, whether it's done by choice or other means, but it's just, that is not healthy. And so the choice to stay connected, whether that's through family, close friends, coworkers, a counselor, some sort of belief in a higher power. For me, my faith with God has been my rock through this whole mm-hmm. journey too. And there's been so many cool little miracles in the story that we don't have time for or you know, but, um, there's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just there's something about community, teamwork, doing life together that pulls you through these moments that you wouldn't be able to do yourself alone. Incredible. There's so many moments during this conversation, Tabitha. You said you wouldn't cry, where I feel like crying. I, I'm just on the verge yeah. this whole time. Love it, and for many <laughs> reasons, like you know, like just pride and sadness and like yeah. all of it. Like, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I've cried lots. I just, my face doesn't change much. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. Beautiful. So when I heard about what happened, I was in shock, obviously. And then I went through my emotions of 
fear and worry. But I also knew that I had to find a way to honor the police officers involved for their incredible, incredible acts of bravery and courage. And for them to also know that they have the love and the support of their community. So I had a connection at the Saanich Police Department, and it was through that connection that I was able to get love medals delivered to the six officers. But I wasn't able to get your names, so I addressed the cards to officer number one, number two, number three, and so on. And then I dropped off the love medals at the police station, and Although I hoped, I didn't expect to get any kind of response afterwards. But one day I got a text from the mom of my son's best friend from grade one. And okay. <laughs> it was a photo of, um, of a man who you could tell was still in recovery, opening his love medal with a beautiful smile on his face. And she texted, my man is officer number six. And... That was you, Tabitha. That was you. Oh, cool. And it was such yeah. a special moment, you know. Um, yeah, that really was. I, I talked about the cards and the gifts and letters and drawings that a lot of us received from the community. And I remember opening up this love medal and I was like, wow, this it's packaged so well. And you open it up and then there's this card that's just so specific and it was just such an impact of love and thoughtfulness that it was just so moving to like tally you're wearing it you can see it on on your shirt there but (laughs) somebody took the time not only to create that and make that that's a skill and art and you're so gifted but to to put the thought to send that out to us i know all of us were moved from that and oh thank you um yeah yeah there's a there's another cool picture of the seven of us in that van that all got them and ideally every cop that showed up that day could get them and every first responder and you know but it was such a special touching movement so thank you oh thank you um i love you both very much i cried when when i got that picture from you tabitha because it just felt like such a gift from Mm -hmm. the universe to be able to have a glimpse into that moment like you were saying where you just felt the love and gratitude that was being expressed to you it was very special and the universe and serendipity at its finest like what are the chances it was just the craziest thing yeah and we hadn't even spoken or texted like during all of this i was like i had my i had so many people text and check in which was amazing but i I, it was just so much i couldn't even keep up so you and I, we weren't even texting. No, not since the kids were in grade one. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> wow. That was incredibly thoughtful. Yeah. So I Aww. just like, I knew that sending a picture would like fill your bucket. Oh, it did. Like, I think, yeah. I can't remember who was here, but it was a friend of mine. And I think my son was also in the kitchen and I just started crying. And they're like, are you okay? Aww. And I'm like, yes, I'm like, so okay. Aww, <laughs> yeah. So good. Yeah. Um, So thanks for including me in that moment. One thing I love to do is have guests share what they feel their rainbow stories are. And that's the obvious storyline in a person's life that is integral in shaping who they are. And it will manifest in challenges and experiences throughout your life that seem to be linked to some kind of life lesson. So I would love for you both to share what you think your rainbow stories are and how you think this experience that you went through ties into your rainbow story. Yeah, what comes to mind is I was originally born and raised in South Africa. And with my family, we immigrated and moved to England and then again to Canada. And through that journey, just faced some really hard, difficult times through bullying, the whole leaving family, adjusting to new cultures. Mm -hmm. I think it just helped shape and form who I am today in many ways. And one of those is being resilient, you know, to go through an experience or circumstance in life where it just reinforces your values and, and morals and builds up the strength to to get you through something hard. And this event that we've been talking about was probably the hardest event I've had to live through and go through and feel like I've done it well because of all the hard times that I've lived through leading up to this, being in 
uh, very mindful of going through something hard and looking at how can I grow from this or what can I take away from this that maybe I don't have to do that again or how could I go through something like this in a similar way but do it better. So just building that resilience to to get through this through a lifetime really. Yeah. I love asking this question because it gets people thinking about and reflecting on a common theme where it's like your life, there's a storyline mm-hmm. and there are things that happened to you in your past, maybe starting from childhood or wherever that almost seem to be like training for what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Can I add something on like, there was many times where the surgeons said, if he wasn't as fit as he was, there is no way he would have survived. So all of the training, all of the hard work, all of the healthy eating, the diligence and just his resilience and dedication to a healthy lifestyle, like that saved him, Hmm. like among many other things. But he didn't know that that was just another step to help keep him alive on this really bad day. Amazing. And so what about for you, Tabitha? I mean, this is a significant part of your story and your journey. Do you see a connection between how your life has been playing out and how this fits into that? 100%. I read about this thing and I think it's called post-traumatic growth. And it's basically you come out on the other side, like just absolutely alive. And it's just from your darkest days. And it's almost as if your wounds turn into wisdom and that leads you to a bigger purpose of self-discovery. And this whole last year and a half has been just self-discovery for me and look back and be like, okay, it happened. It's for a reason. I'm better. I have such a healthier like outlook. I've always been such like a go, go, go type of person and want to have control of my life and every aspect in it. Mm -hmm. It's something that I have taken away from Damien is like, just have faith. I love that. That is probably the biggest thing that I've taken from my relationship with him and his family is just slow down and just have faith. Mm. Like it's okay. What's meant to be will be. It's all happening as it should. And that's been the fun part. Mm. You know, that saying, it's not about the destination. It's the journey. But It's not even just about the journey. It's the company on that journey. And so I've been incredibly intentional the last little while of just having faith and doing what feels right and choosing to really be present in the moment and not be worrying about the future or what's going to be what has to happen or what I want to happen. So that's Mm -hmm. what I've I've taken from this. That's beautiful. And actually perfect transition into what I wanted to ask next, which is how do you both slow down and celebrate your small daily victories? What are those victories for you and how do you celebrate them? So through this whole experience, what's been so highlighted to me is how fragile life is. Mm. You hear of crazy stories happening to to different people around the world and you're like oh yeah life is fragile but until you go through something yourself or um, somebody so close to you goes through something that doesn't hit home and so for me going from my time in the hospital where you're literally going hour by hour to as I was getting healthier day by day I'd find a little win in each day and celebrate that it got to the point where I got out of the hospital and there'd be a moment More so when I was mobile, I was able to drive and kind of feel like I was doing normal life again, but in a different way, where I just break down and cry and just be so happy to be alive, to to be here, you know? You know, I always valued life. An example that comes to mind was every time I'd go for a run, I'd just thank God for my ability to move because there are people that can't move or run, you know, they're bound by some sort of disability or injury and I was so conscious of that and so thankful for my ability to just enjoy life physically like that. And then so for it to be all taken from me and now I'm that guy with the injuries and disability and I can't walk or can't move. The win for me is being here today, being alive. And then everything on top of that is, you know, like now I can walk. I just stopped walking with a cane a few weeks ago. And Beautiful. I have goals and I'm achieving them. The winds just keep stacking up on top of each other. So it's just taking a moment to slow down and realize what I have um, because it, it could always be worse. 
I love this conversation. There's so much good stuff in there for anyone listening to either connect with or be inspired by. Last question for both of you before we go into a quick round of questions is how do you see everything you went through as a source of inspiration for anyone who's going through a very challenging time right now and maybe they're facing health issues themselves or a loved one is going through something touch and go with their life. How do you Mm -hmm. see what you went through being a way to inspire other people who are in what you were going through? Yeah, I think just sharing the story and being real and vulnerable, it's a bit of a theme that's come through. There's power in that because when you're going through something extremely difficult, for me anyway, I would feel like I'd want to withdraw and just isolate myself. But I mentioned it earlier, it's just you have to stay connected. If I can encourage anyone listening that is going through a tough time is just reach out. And it's so healthy just talking about it, being able to connect with another human and just be real. Talk about where you're at, what's hard, what's hurting, what what are you struggling with? Mm -hmm. There's a saying, pain shared is pain divided. If you think about all this this hurt and this pain and this hard time you're going through, if I keep that to myself, that's a burden for me. And that becomes just so heavy yeah. and drags me down. But if I share that by just talking, all of a sudden mm-hmm. I've given some of that burden away. Not that this other person is taking it or owning it, but you know what I mean? It's just, it just becomes lighter of a load to yeah. carry. No, 100%. And that was a huge healing thing for me is I had always been very open with my friends and um, my support group. And that was huge for me. Yeah. And that's why I'm so incredibly thankful that you were both willing and ready to come and share your story, because that's my whole intention with this podcast is to be able to share real stories of adversity that people face. And then also to just have the joy in the story as well. Like, how does one get through it? What do you do while you're in it? And when you come out of it? might be cliche, but you know, you will rise from the ashes, but burning has to happen. And you might be in that burning season, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but just knowing that you will rise again and beautiful, there will be that light, like, but it's absolutely true. Absolutely. I love that you just said that. Yes. Thank you. Are you both ready for just a quick round of questions? Yeah. Fun. (laughs) Okay. So, I always have to say this because you feel free to answer them quickly, but they do still end up being kind of deep questions. <laughs> oh, but yeah, boy. yeah, you're like, oh boy. Um, so the first one is, uh, when do you feel the most seen for who you truly are? Smiling. I think I smile a lot. And I, love that. I think that I think that's just a reflection of what's happening in your heart. That's perfect. I love it. You can't follow up yeah, with that next. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> Boom. Um, <laughs> what's the one way you honor yourself every day? Prayer and being very vocal out loud about what I'm grateful for. Good. Yeah, it's a good one. For me, it's having patience. I'm always wanting the next, especially through this physical recovery, I'm, I'm wanting the next milestone to be achieved where it's like, okay, just have patience. Be okay with where you're at now that'll come but just slow down it's okay to be where you're at you guys are rocking these (laughs) what's your favorite way to celebrate and this is a pg podcast oh okay (laughs) (laughs) just being with people in in my circle yeah yeah again it just speaks to that community and connecting lives together and just high-fiving and enjoying that moment together. Yeah, perfect. What's a piece of jewelry, accessory, or gift you have that has particular meaning for you and why? Ooh, I was just in Hawaii and I got this necklace and I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's Morse code for a Bible verse. That's cool. Yes, I love it. And it's Jeremiah 29 11 for i know the plans i have for you yeah it's just reminding myself every day like i was talking about earlier i don't need to worry i don't need to stress i don't need to try and control everything that's going to happen for me that is perfect and how about for you damien i have this one ring that i wear i don't know if you can see that it's got 
Nice. Like a, a reticle for a scope representing the tactical unit that I'm so proud to be a part of. And then it has the Canadian maple leaf. So I'm now a Canadian citizen and just, yeah, very proud to be Canadian. Beautiful. And just two things that I wear with pride. I love it. It's so funny that you asked that question. Why? <laughs> I just feel like we both had something that was meaningful to us, but mm -hmm. most people? Yeah, everybody has something. Yeah. Cool. And it's almost always some kind of accessory or piece of jewelry. That's just, I think, something that has been there since the beginning of time, as long as human beings have been adorning themselves with stuff. Beca tattoos. Tattoos. Because it's about what it symbolizes and it, the meanings and we carry it with us wherever we're going mm -hmm. um and it carries energy with it too so yeah everybody has something so far and it reminds me whereas if i wasn't wearing it i wouldn't have that reminder multiple times a day yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah that's so good um mm -hmm. so what does the future hold for each of you not thinking about it not thinking about it <laughs> not <laughs> exactly. worrying about it just yeah. chilling out <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. My goal is to get back to what I was doing. I worked so hard to get on the team and yeah. loved that job so much. It, it didn't feel like a job. So my goal is to recover to the point where I get to a new normal. I can pass the physical test to get back on the team. I have one more surgery to go. And then, yeah, hopefully a few months of recovery and back at it. Amazing. Am I allowed to share that you're thinking about becoming a firefighter? Oh, me? <laughs> <laughs> this is news to me. Oh, is it? Yep. Okay. That's funny. But it's something that you're thinking of now. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I... I love you both so much as just human beings and I'm so inspired now more than ever and I already was just in awe of both of you before we even had this conversation. You're incredible people. Thank you so much for being who you are and for everything that you do and yeah, just lots of love to both of you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you too. Thank you. After having this incredible conversation with Damien and Tabitha, I reflected on everything that had been shared. Damien and Tabitha demonstrated an unshakable commitment to having faith, not just in life, but also in themselves and in others. From knowing without question that Damien will survive, to their trust and faith in friends, family, teammates, caregivers, and God. I'd like to honor and recognize Damien and Tabitha with Love Medals Certificates for going above and beyond in the area of faith. Damien and Tabitha, you are an inspiration. Thank you for being who you are. I see, honor, celebrate, and love you both. Thank you to those listening or watching. Please like and subscribe. If you'd like to honor yourself or someone close to you with a Love Medal, please visit lovemetals.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at lovemetals. Love and blessings to you all. There's a little cat back there. Oh my God, so cute. Uh, Hello, who's that? <laughs> Get out of here. You're not the star of the show. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. 